That is the God that we worship this morning. Will you stand together as we sing and praise him?
us this morning. If you're here for the first time, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we would appreciate it if you could take just a few moments to fill out the, uh, the visitor card that you got when you came in today. We'd like to get to know you, how we might be able to minister to your needs. I want to just remind you real quickly of a few things coming up. Uh, next Saturday, we're going to be having a new member class. And if you've been coming here for a while and you've never joined our church and you're interested in doing that, we would love to have you come be part of that class. I uh, already got quite a few people signed up. So if you're interested in that, just let me know. I'll get you the materials. Also, just a reminder to the men to uh, sign up for the men's breakfast on Saturday. We would love to have you come and, and be part of that as well. This morning, we are focusing on the God who is the great creator who made the heavens and the earth, who created each one of us. And we want to continue now to praise him for his mighty power. <laughs> into the throne room of God and and we see there these four living creatures who are around the throne and giving praise to God for his creation saying worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
are here today to lift you up and to praise you, to thank you for the beauty of your creation that we see around us every day, to praise you for the fact that you're sovereign over that creation, praise you for the fact that you're powerful and mighty, that you just spoke it into being. And Father, thank you that you've created us to be able to enjoy that. And Father, as we think today about who you are and and about that creation, Father, may we just be in awe and wonder of who you are. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Good morning. How you doing? All right. I like you'll be able to see what's in there in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I brought with me today some plans, and this one, these are ones that I drew up. We've been working on some stuff in our, in our kitchen, and so we have these plans, and you can see on there, there's some drawings, and there's some, tells how wide these are and how long, and the contractor that's going to do the work needs these plans because they have to know exactly how to do the work, so they have to have those plans, so there's one kind of plan. And then here's another set of plans. This was a set of plans for a swimming pool. And it showed exactly how they were going to do it. So it has all the, the different dimensions on there. And over here it tells all the details about how the, the pool is going to be built. And the person that would built that pool, they needed to have these plans in order to build the pool. Because if they didn't have plans and they went out there and just started digging a hole and stuff, they wouldn't really know what to do, right? So they have to have the plans. So anything that we build... We have to have a plan to follow, or otherwise it's probably not going to come out very well, right? And you guess what? God has also developed a plan for each one of our lives. The Bible tells us that before we were born, that God had a plan for our lives, before we, were even, before we even came to this earth, and that that plan God has, he says, is the what's very best for us. And how do you guys think we find out what God's plan is for our life? How do we understand what that plan is? What do you think we have that would help us with that? You guys are quiet this morning. <laughs> How about the Bible? You think the Bible could help us? Yeah, because in the Bible there's some things it tells us about how God wants us to live our lives, right? But there's some things that are different too. So how do you think you might find out what God exactly wants you to do other than read the Bible? What do you think? You think? A dictionary, that might help, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? A cement truck could help you, okay. <laughs> oh, cement in the pool, yep, that would do it. So how about our lives? How do we find out what God's plan is for us? What do you think? What do you think? Okay, instructions in the Bible. How else might we find out? What do you think, Tyler? Okay, obey his commands, absolutely. What do you think? Pray. That's one of the best things we can do and ask God because God wants us to understand his plans. He wants us to know what his plans for our life look like. So let's, uh, let's ask God to do that for us. Let's pray. Father, I pray for all of us and especially these boys and girls that, that you would just make known your plan for our lives, Father, and that we'd be obedient to that. Help us as we read the Bible and as we pray. And as we're guided by your Holy Spirit to follow the plan that you have for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you going back there? <laughs> I thought maybe he's going to preach today. That should be okay. <laughs> that would be great. Well, you know, we live in a, a culture that's becoming increasingly more secular. So, so it's really not too surprising in a lot of ways that, that 
even some Christians have kind of bought into a myth that's out there in our culture. One that comes from the idea that we have become so much more secular. And, and it's an idea that's really put forth, an idea that has as, as a proponent some of the people that are considered to be some of the most brilliant people in the world. For instance, most of you may be familiar with uh, Stephen Hawking. He was a physicist, and, and he recently passed away. And back in, I think it was about 2010, he had an interview with Diane Sawyer. And during that interview, he said this. He said, there's a fundamental difference between religion, which is based on authority, and science, which is based on observation and reason. And then he said this, science will win because it works. Or how about Richard Dawkins? Richard Dawkins is a, is a well-known uh, atheist. He's an a, uh, evolutionary biologist. And uh, back in a book he wrote back in 1976 called The Selfish Gene, he wrote this. Faith cannot move mountains. And then he says, though generations of children are solemnly told, to the, told the contrary and believe it, but it is capable of driving people to such dangerous folly that faith seems to qualify as a kind of mental illness. Or one other time he said this when he was uh, being interviewed, or actually he was given a lecture in Edinburgh, and he said this. He says, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is the belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. And finally, let me just share this quote from a guy named Sam Harris. He's a, a neuroscientist, he's a philosopher, he's an author, and he wrote a book called The End of Faith, and he said this, We have names for people who have many beliefs for which there is no rational justification. When their beliefs are extremely common, we call them religious. Otherwise, they're likely to be called mad, psychotic, or delusional. That's what we're faced with in the culture today. And, and people hear these things and, and they begin to believe this myth that we're going to address here this morning as we look at the last of these five questions that we've been looking at here in this, this sermon series called Hard Questions and Honest Answers. And we've dealt with some tough questions and, and the one we're going to deal with this morning is this. Doesn't science contradict faith? Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you've even been led to believe that to some degree. I, I even know some Christians who who accept that. They say, well, yeah, science and faith, they really are contradictory, but, but I'm just going to choose to believe in spite of that. But I think this morning we're going to see that that's not true. Now, I know there are some scientists in here. I know there are some mathematicians in here and some, some engineers and some people who really like things kind of like nice and orderly. I'm kind of like that myself. I I, my degree originally was in accounting, and so I like things nice and reasonable and, and logical and in order. And maybe your struggle sometimes with this idea of does faith really contradict science? And there's some others of you here in this morning that, that frankly probably have some family members and some friends and some other people that you love very much who have been... Con, con, been uh, just brought to believe that there is no God because they're scientists and they can't really believe in that. And maybe you're really struggling with that. So this morning, we're going to kind of deal with this whole idea of whether or not that, that science contradicts faith. And I'm going to do this a little bit differently than what I've done throughout the rest of the sermon series this morning. I'm going to take just a few minutes to share with you three truths about science and faith to kind of to kind of set the, the foundation for us this morning. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just show you a couple of videos with some Scripture passages and let you make that decision for yourself this morning when you see some of these amazing things that God has done. So let me share with you briefly just these three truths about science and faith that we want to use as a background this morning. The first one is this, that everyone has faith-based presuppositions. Now, the, the scientists might not admit this, but they, they have their own faith-based presuppositions, if you think about it. Everyone does. We all have certain backgrounds. We've all been raised in certain ways. We have, we have certain things that have been brought into our lives, our family background, where we grew up, where we were born, 
our education, the media that influences it, and all those things begin to develop in us these different presuppositions that we have. And that's true whether you're a scientist, it's true whether, whether you're, you're faith-based, you might say. You know, we've been, we've been told all along this idea that somehow that, that faith is not based on reason, that it's just like blind, you know, you hear about blind faith, and that science is all based on, on reason and observation, but, but even that's not totally true. And so this morning we need to understand that everyone has their own presuppositions. I was reading this week about a, a lady who was a, a disciple of Jesus, and she was a nurse, and she was at a hospital. And this hot particular hospital, the doctors had said, look, we're not allowing any kind of faith in here at all. This is just going to be a secular hospital, and we're not going to ba- base any decisions on anything just other than science. And so one day it came to the point where there was a man that they had to decide whether or not they were going to take him off life support. And so they talked about that, and one of the doctors, the nurse related, said this, said, well, at least we know that if we take him off life support, he won't be suffering anymore. And the nurse thought about that for a while. Everyone else nodded in agreement, but she says, well, how does the doctor know that? How how does the doctor know that after that person dies, they won't be suffering anymore? There's certain presuppositions that 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 doctor had to make about what life is like after death in order to make that to make that conclusion. So even what was a supposedly a science-based conclusion is based on these presuppositions and and everyone has those even atheists have certain presuppositions about the fact that there is no god and they base they base everything that they do even though they can't prove there's no god. And so all of us have these these faith-based presuppositions. And we need to understand that when we talk about this this supposed conflict between science and faith. The second thing that we need to understand this morning is that that science and the Bible are answering different questions. They're answering different questions. Let's suppose that we had this really nice thunderstorm out in the desert like the ones we get here during the middle of the monsoon season. And that after that thunderstorm was over, that I took some of you out and, and, and we were sitting outside just kind of observing what was going on and I were to ask one of you, what do you smell? And you would say, well, I smell the, the wet creosote. Have you ever smelled that after the rain out in the desert? You know, it smells really great, doesn't it? And I were to ask another one of you, well, what do you hear? And you say, well, I hear the sound of, of rushing water. And then I'd ask the third one of you, well, what do you see? And you look up in the sky and you say, well, I see a rainbow. Now, which one of you was right? All of you were right. And is there any conflict between the three different, even though there are three different answers, is there a conflict there? No, because they were asking three different questions. And a lot of the supposed contradictions that there are between, between science and the Bible come about because Science and the Bible are really trying to to answer different questions. When it comes to science, the the question that science is really trying to answer is the question, how? How do things come about? How do things work? And so when, for instance, when a scientist begins to study about about creation, they want to understand how did it happen? How did the earth form? How did How did animal and plant life come to be? You know, how did those things happen? Those are the questions they ask. Or if they're a chemist, they want to ask, if I put this chemical together with this chemical, how are they going to react together? If you're like me when you were a kid, you're hoping they're going to explode when you get your chemistry set right as a kid. And that's what you want to know. You want to know how are these things going to react with each other if I put them together? And that's primarily the the question that science is asking. But the Bible, on the other hand, is really answering a couple of other questions. It's answering two other questions. It's answering the question, who, and the question, why. Now, there are certain things that that science can't even begin to answer, even some how questions. Things like, how did we get our ability to have reason? How do we have the, the, the consciousness to to appreciate beautiful art or a beautiful landscape or even God's creation. How did, how did that develop? They can't answer those. 
But the Bible gives us some insight because it focuses on something else. It focuses on who and why. And so when the Bible begins to teach us about creation, it's focused, first of all, on who did it, right? The fact that God did it. In the beginning, God. That's what the Bible's trying to teach us about creation. Who did it? That's more important than how it came about. And the, the second question that the Bible answers that, that science is not so much interested in is why? why? Why did God create everything? And we get the answer also, don't we, in the, in the Scriptures. The reason that God created all of this is because He wanted cre to create man who could have fellowship with Him and a man who could enjoy all this beautiful creation that God spoke into being. And so science and in the Bible, sometimes seem to contradict because they're, they're attempting to answer different questions. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some times when scientists come up with stuff that completely contradicts the Bible and that, that, that we don't need to be aware of that and we don't need to understand that we need to stick with the Bible. And what's really interesting to me is that, that in those areas where that's happened over time is that the more that science discovers, guess what? the more they determine that, that, that what really happened according to the Bible is true. That science more and more begins to prove the Bible. But sometimes we have these contradictions just because we're trying to answer different questions and, and we need to be aware of that. The third thing that we need to understand is that God is the one who makes science possible. I'll bet most scientists don't even think about this, but think about it. Most of the, the great civilizations throughout history, they, they've had some scientific achievements, but nothing like what we've seen in the last maybe two to three hundred years, something like that. And I believe a lot of that has to do with the, the influence and impact of Christianity, even though it's been around for a while. I mean, think about it. Some of these ancient cultures, they believed in pantheism. We talked about this a little bit last week, in which God is kind of present in all of his creation. So... So if you see a rock, well, God's in that rock. Or you see a tree. And think about what that would mean for scientific discovery. If you think God exists in all these things, you're not going to begin to, to look at those things because you don't want to get into something that, that's really God. I mean, that's, science is not going to look at that if, if you, that's your, your, kind of your mindset. Or you think about even like Judaism and, and Islam, they're... They're more concerned with how do you follow the law. And so, so even those religions aren't really so concerned with science and, and looking at things. Or you look at, at some of the ancient cultures that believed in a multitude of gods, and for them, there was really no reason to, to look into science because they just explained everything, well, the gods did it. So there was no real reason. But think about what God did in the Bible. He, he tells us that He created this universe. It's a universe of order. It's a universe where, where the physical laws of nature are true in all places, at all times. And without that, science couldn't even operate. And so it's really only because of the way that God has created our universe with this, this idea of order, with the idea that things operate the same way that that the sun comes up every day actually the sun's not coming up right we all know that the earth's just rotating but it that's what it appears like it happens day after day after day and science couldn't even exist if it weren't for the fact that that's the kind of world that god has created so as i said I, i'm going to kind of leave you with those those three thoughts this morning and here's what we're going to do for the next several minutes, is we're going to look at two videos. One kind of begins with the macro of God's creation. It's going to, it's going to show you what, what our earth is like compared to the vastness of all of God's creation. And then the other one, we're going to go completely the other way. We're going to go to the micro and go down way deep inside the human body and see how God has created that and what He's done there. And then interspersed with that are just going to be some scriptures. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. is just to think about these scriptures as they come up and meditate on them. Watch these videos and make that decision for yourself.
So let's begin. This is DNA in its classic double helix form, and it's from X-ray crystallography, so it's an accurate model of DNA. If we unwind the double helix and unzip the two strands, you see these things that look like teeth. Those are the letters of genetic code, the 25,000 genes you've got written in your DNA. This is what they typically talk about, the genetic code. This is what they're talking about. But I want to talk about a different aspect of DNA science, and that is the, the physical nature of DNA. And it's these two strands that run in opposite directions for reasons I can't go into right now, but they physically run in opposite directions, which creates a number of complications for your living cells, as you're about to see, most particularly when DNA is being copied. And so, what I'm about to show you is an accurate representation of the actual DNA replication machine that's occurring right now inside your body, at least 2002 uh, biology. So and DNA is entering the production line from the left-hand side, and it hits this collection, this miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA strand and making an exact copy. So DNA comes in and hits this blue donut-shaped structure, and it's ripped apart into its two strands. One strand can be copied directly, and it can see, be seen spooling off down to the bottom there. But things aren't so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. So it's thrown out repeatedly in these loops and copied one section at a time, creating two new DNA molecules. Now, you have billions of this machine right now whirring the right way inside you, copying your DNA with exquisite fidelity. It's an accurate representation, and it's pretty much at the correct speed for what is occurring inside you. But I've left out error correction and a bunch of other things. Um, this was work from a number of years ago. Thank you. This is work from a number of years ago, but what I want to show you next is updated science. It's updated technology. So again, we begin with DNA, and it's jiggling and wiggling there because of the surrounding super molecules, which I've stripped away so you can see something. DNA is about two nanometers across, which is really quite tiny. But in, a, in each one of your cells, each strand of DNA is about 30 to 40 million nanometers long. So to keep the DNA organized, regulate access to the genetic code, it's wrapped around these purple proteins. I've labeled them purple here. It's packaged up and bundled up. All of this field of view is a single strand of DNA. This huge package of DNA is called a chromosome. And we'll come back to chromosomes in a minute. We're pulling out, we're zooming out, out through a nuclear pore, which is sort of the gateway to this compartment that holds all the DNA called the nucleus. All of this field of view is about a semester's worth of biology, and I've got seven minutes, so we're not going to be able to do that today. No, I'm being told no. Um, this is the way a living cell looks down a light, light microscope, and it's been filmed under time lapse, which is why you can see it moving. The nuclear envelope breaks down. These sausage-shaped things are the chromosomes, and we'll focus on them. They go through this very striking motion that is focused on these little red spots. When the field cell feels it's ready to go, it rips apart the chromosome. One set of DNA goes to one side, the other side gets the other set of DNA, identical copies of DNA, and then the cell splits down the middle. And again, you have billions of cells undergoing this process right now inside of you. Now we're gonna rewind and just focus on the chromosomes and look at its structure and describe it. So again, here we are at that equator moment. The chromosomes line up, and if we isolate just one chromosome, we're gonna pull it out and have a look at its structure. So this is one of the biggest molecular structures that you have, in, at least as far as we've discovered so far, inside of us. So this is a single chromosome, and you have two strands of DNA in each chromosome. One is bundled up into one sausage, the other strand uh, is bundled up into the other sausage. These things that look like whiskers that are sticking out from either side are the dynamic scaffolding of the cell. Um, they're called microtubules, but the name's not so important. But what we're gonna focus on is this red region. I've labeled it red here. And it's the interface between the dynamic scaffolding and the chromosomes. It is obviously central to the movement of the chromosomes. We have no idea really, as to how it's achieving that movement. We've been studying this thing they call the kinetic core for over 100 years with intense study, and we're still just beginning to discover what it's all about. It is made up of about 200 different types of proteins, thousands of proteins in total. It is a signal broadcasting system. It broadcasts through chemical signals telling the rest of the cell when it's ready, when, when it feels that everything is aligned and ready to go of the, for the separation of the chromosomes it is able to couple onto the growing and shrinking microtubules. It's transiently, it's, it's, it's involved with the growing of the microtubules, and it's able to transiently couple onto them. It's also a tension sensing system. It's able to feel when the cell is ready, when, when the chromosome is correctly positioned. It's turning green here because it, it feels that everything is just right. And you'll see that there's one little last bit that's still remaining red. 
and it's walked away down the microtubules. That is the signal broadcasting system, sending out the stop signal, and it's walked away. I mean, it's that mechanical. It's molecular clockwork. This is how you work at the molecular scale. So with a little bit of molecular eye candy, um, We've got kinesins, which are the orange ones. They're little uh, molecular courier molecules walking one way. And here are the dynein. They're carrying that very broadcasting system, and they've got their long legs so they can step around obstacles and so on. So again, this is all derived accurately from the science. The problem is we can't show it to you any other way. Are you all ready for your exam now? I don't know about you, but I don't have any problem answering that question when I see that, when I see God's Word, when I see the, the intricacy of what God has designed in us and the, the vastness of the universe that He spoke into being. There was a science writer named uh, can't find his name here, Fred Heeren, and he devoted seven years of his life to trying to answer the question: Is there is there scientific proof? Is there evidence that there is a God out there? And when he got to the end of that time, he wrote these words. He says, "Science can't observe God, but we can observe a universe that yields evidence of one of two things." It is either God's handiwork or it got there by accident without a creator. The evidence has to point one way or the other. And scientific discoveries of this century clearly show that our universe is no accident. That there is an intelligent designer behind it all. Romans chapter 1, Paul reminds us of the fact that the problem is not that there isn't any evidence for God. There's plenty of evidence out there that there is a God. The problem is, is that, that mankind suppresses that knowledge, that mankind suppresses that evidence of the fact that there is a God. <clears throat> and if you've been doing that, that in your life, then this morning I want to invite you to, to accept the fact that God loves you and God cares for you so much that, that He created an amazing universe. And at the same time that he created you uniquely as you are. I don't know about you, but, but I don't have any question about whether science contradicts faith. I think they go hand in hand. And my prayer for you this morning is that that would be, that would be true for you as well. Let's pray. Father, I, I'm just amazed by who you are. Amazed by your creation, Father. And even amazed by the fact that, that someone could look at all the things that we've looked at today and somehow come to the conclusion that there is no God. And Father, I know that um, probably everyone who's here today, they, they have, they're, not, they're here because they haven't come to that conclusion. But Father, we all know people who have, who have been turned away from God, who have put up barriers to God because because they believe in science and believe that it somehow contradicts the Bible. And Father, my prayer is that, that somehow you would touch their hearts. Father, I know there are some people here this morning who have loved ones, people in their families who, who have been kept from you, Father, by that kind of a mindset. And I pray you would do your work in their lives. I pray that you would equip the people that are here that that have the ability to have an influence in their life, to be able to maybe share some of the things that they've learned today. Father, we do praise you and honor you. We thank you for who you are. We do that in Jesus' name.
as we do each week, we have a, a time for us to, uh, to give this morning back to God out of, the, out of gratefulness for what He has done for us, for the fact that He is this, this great Creator who created everything and that we want to give back to Him. So we're going to do that. We'll sing a closing song. If you have a decision to make this morning, if you'd like even just someone to pray with you, I'll be at the back as we do that this morning. We'll go ahead now and, and worship God with our, with our offering. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Lord, we thank you for providing for us. Thank you that you created the universe, you created our earth, you created um, our every breath, our lives. Um, and we just praise you and thank you and ask that you would help us worship you and give as we should. In Jesus' name, amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, it is well with our soul today because you are the why, you are the who. God, we look to your creation every day and we just stand in awe of everything that you have done. Lord God, help us this week to not lose that awe and wonder, to look to you in all of your creation, God, and to share those things with those in our lives who may not know about you. And all God's people said, Amen.